Um, so again, welcome to my talk. I'm uh, happy and proud to present our paper about in inducing authentication failures to bypass credit card pins. So the result that we have actually in the paper is about a flaw in the MasterCard contactless protocol that allows an attacker who controls the NFC channel of this uh, contactless transaction to arbitrarily change the cardholder verification method. So he can either downgrade it uh, to signature, for example, or he could completely remove it. Uh, this is joint work with David Basin and uh, Jorge Toropozzo. Um, at this point, I want to thank my two co-authors. They had a bit more experience in this field and published some papers on uh, this topic beforehand. So to start with a little bit of background, um, so EMV is actually the standard for smart card payments that is uh, used globally. EMV stands for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. Europay was a company that was uh, bought by MasterCard in the 90s, I guess. And it was also in the 90s when the standard, standard was defined. So the idea was that um, when the integrated circuit chips came up, then um, these uh, smart cards payment would use these chips and store, for example, data from the issuer on the smart card and even have some cryptographic functionality. So um, these integrated circuit chips can do digital signatures in RSA and can do AES. There are globally um, a lot of cards around. So this was nine plus billion, I think was said last year. This year I've read something that it's already 11 millions of smart cards. And this EMV standard uh, describes the communication between a card and nowadays also phones where you have on device cards and terminals and ATMs. The cards are either physically inserted into the card reader or they communicate a contactless, and this is what we are focused on, with NFC. Recently, I've also seen that there are ATMs, at least it was the first time that I've seen it in Europe, that support this contactless feature with NFC. For the whole ecosystem, it involves quite a number of stakeholders. So from the right to the left, we have uh, the issuing bank or the issuer. So this is where the card holder has his account. And this issuer then has a contract with a payment network, for example, Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. And last but not least, we then have an acquirer. This is the one who provides the terminals. So for example, SumUp is a terminal provider that provides terminals either on a rent base or sells it to merchants. Then this EMV standard or EMV protocol is executed between the card and the terminal. Last but not least, we then have the cardholder who is then involved in the cardholder verification step. So if we look at the steps of the contactless protocol, all starts with an application selection. So the terminal basically asks the card what kind of uh, kernels, as it's called in the standard, it supports. And so basically asks how it can communicate with the card and where to find information on the card. In the next step, then we have the synchronization um, phase where for example, the terminal tells, or the terminal tells the card uh, what the amount of the payment is, what the, what the currency is, and uh, further information. On the other side, the card actually tells the term, uh, terminal what kind of data it needs in order to complete the transaction, <clears throat> and also what kind of cardholder verification method it supports. In the next step, this is actually outside the communication protocol, there is the cardholder verification step. So the question is, is this indeed a legitimate cardholder? And <clears throat> this is, as we will see later on, um, transported or communicated as a list from the card to the terminal. Last but not least, we have the authentication and authorization step where we want to verify that um, indeed everything is correct, so the card is a legitimate card, and last but not least, also involves then the issuer or the issuing bank that checks that the account balance is accordingly. 
So for the security of the contactless protocol, it mainly focuses on integrity. So the um, communication between the card and the reader actually is in plain. And what um, the authentication and authorization phase make sure, as I said before, that um, in a first step, in a so-called offline auto, uh, authentication step, the terminal and the card make sure, or better said, the terminal checks if the card is indeed a valid card. This uses public key cryptography, so the card, we will see it afterwards, has a certificate that is issued by the issuer, and in that sense proves that it's a valid card and that everything and all the information on the card is correct. The terminal itself has a list of root certificates and checks then that the certificate is valid and in that sense then can verify the integrity <coughs> of the parameters. For example, this uh, cult holder verification method list that has been provided by the card. In a second step, this online step, this involves the issuer or the bank and this is based on symmetric cryptography. There is a shared key that is shared between the card and the bank. And there is a message authentication code used that uh, basically authenticates or integrity uh, protects uh, critical transaction elements such as the amount, <coughs> the currency, and so on. The terminal then sends the data or um, the MAC then to the terminal and the terminal forwards it then last but not least to the issuer who then uh, checks for its correctness. So for our attacker model, I have said in the beginning that uh, the attacker controls the NFC channel, so the contactless channel between the card and the terminal. We actually don't care, or we also have no clue what's happening in this secure black box that's um, all the communication after the terminal. Um, but we assume that the attacker controls this uh, channel between the card and the terminal. And so, as we said in the beginning, the attacker's goal is to execute arbitrary payments <coughs> uh, with a victim's card without or with a downgrade of the cardholder verification. The prerequisite that we have is that the attacker controls this NFC connection, and there are two scenarios that are commonly um, that are quite common to fulfill this prerequisite. So one is that the card is stolen or lost and ha has not been revoked so far. The other one would be uh, that an attacker, for example, relays the NFC channel between the victim's cards, so the card would still be in the possession of the victim and a terminal of his choice. So to look at the protocol that is executed between the terminal and the card, we have here um, a sequence chart of the protocol. So on the left is uh, the terminal. So it starts actually with an unguessable number that identifies then this uh, session with the card uniquely. On the card side, we have, as I already mentioned, for example, um, the issuer's name and the public key of the issuer as well as certificates that um, are on the one hand signed by, uh, uh, by a certificate authority. And on the other hand, we have then a certificate of the card that is signed by the issuer. And in the first step, this is actually the application selection step. So here the, uh, the terminal wants to know which kind of kernels are supported by the card, he then gets an answer. This might be multiple um, potential kernels, for example, here, MasterCard and the Maestro card. Then uh, he asks for more information. For example, he gets the processing options, data, uh, processing options data object list, which contains important information to settle uh, the um, to, to, to settle the transaction finally, such as the amount and the currency. Then there is furthermore uh, the CDOL, the card risk management data object list. This is a list that is defined by the issuer uh, to make sure or to validate that uh, the transaction has been correct. Furthermore, he then gets with this um, read record step um, further information, for example, the primary account number, the expiration date of the card, um, these tags and the CDOLs that are required by the issuer, and he gets uh, the public key index 
of the certificate authority that has signed the certificate for the issuer key. Furthermore, there is sent then this cardholder verification method list that is a list that describes the capabilities in terms of cardholder verification methods. This is a list um, where typically or nowadays there is simply the pin. It might also include a signature um, or potentially other methods, for example, for mobile phones that would be on, um, on device um, cardholder verification possible. The red elements are actually the elements that we modify for our attack or that help us in our attack. The first one, the Maestro AID application identifier is not that important. We just had uh, problems in running our attack with Maestro cards, but this was actually quite easy to solve since we could easily turn them into a master card and they would be processed with the same kernel without any problems. Then on the very bottom, we um, changed this certificate authority public key index, and we changed this cardholder verification method list to include only the cardholder verification methods we want to um, be checked then. This ISC denial flag is another uh, issuer action code flags that uh, we change, but that is not of further importance. So then we have this step that actually defines the authorization or authentication phase that is done by the, uh, by the terminal. And as I said already, we have two, namely this offline check where uh, the terminal checks basically on, based on public key cryptography the validity of all the parameters that uh, he was provided by the card. <clears throat> um, our goal is now actually what we want to do is we want to change this um, cardholder verification method list to a list of our choice. So the flaw or the problem that is actually in this specification is that the CVM list is only integrity protected by the card certificate. So this CVM list or hash of it is actually part of um, that has been signed by the issuer and so actually is only checked in this offline authentication step. So the question is now, what if offline authentication fails? And going through the spec, one finds a suspicious code, uh, pseudocode fragment where it said that if this CA public key index is not present in the list or in the database that the terminal actually has, then the, terminally, that, that, then the terminal simply sets the CAD flag to failed and skips this offline verification step. Why is this suspicious? There are a lot of other reasons why offline authentication might fail. For example, you could modify the certificate or whatever. And in all the other cases, uh, the um, <clears throat> transaction is immediately terminated. So then we have furthermore, if this has failed in the terminal verification results and if the device cardholder verification is not supported by the device, so if it's not a non-device card, then do not request and simply forget about this uh, offline verification step. So this is actually our attack in the concept then. So we have this active man in the middle. We have two Android uh, mobile apps that we came up with that basically relays between the card and the terminal, and that allows us to modify these elements of the communication. So what we do in this step is that we set this um, CAPKI index to a value where the terminal doesn't have an entry in his database, and we modify the CVM list according to our Wish. So this means that we can either downgrade it or completely remove the CVM list and thereby skip cardholder verification in total. So the results, we have tested our findings in real-world payments with seven different cards issued by three different banks from two countries on different terminal models. We have successfully bypassed the PIN verification in nine transactions using five different cards of two issuers for one issuer. 
uh, their fraud detection system actually detected there, there is something fishy going on. So they got information that um, the offline uh, verification didn't take place. And thus then in the online verification step, the transaction was refused. One terminal, uh, this is exclusively used in Switzerland for public transportations. Uh, there it seems not to be vulnerable to our attack. Our guess is that they postpone um, public key crypto operations um, to the end of the whole transaction, which means that it still required this offline verification step. So in summary, EMV is a complex protocol executed between the card device and the terminal. Specification and protocol description are quite complex, at least for humans. Multiple stakeholders are involved that might influence the outcome of a transaction. Results <clears throat> um, are presented from a specification or the results presented that uh, have really their roots in the specification. So it's not an implementation bug, it's really in the specification. The vul vulnerability has been verified in real world transactions and we finally have uh, re discovered um, our attack trace in the Tamarine model of the EMV protocol, and we have proved our countermeasures formally in Tamarine. Thanks. <laughs>